name is Kevin Vincent. I am from the University of Florida, and I direct the running medicine clinic there. Uh, myself and my better half, Dr. Heather Vincent, who runs our sport performance center at the University of Florida. Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, we really would like to thank our uh, sponsors and the members of the panel, and we'll introduce them as we go forward. We're basically going to talk about the science of the running shoe. We're excited to have this discussion. Literally, I could talk about running shoes all day long. So, uh, not to take up everybody's time, I will step aside, but it's one of my favorite topics to discuss. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Heather Vincent, and we'll get started. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you. A special thanks to the ACSM and Nate Boudreau for helping organize this event. Um, having industry partners bring the science to the forefront helps us as consumers, as care providers, and as teams that help athletes and patients with selecting what is the right running shoe for them. So as we go forward, I just wanted to share this infographic with you. Please feel free to use and share. And that the reason we're doing this is that the interest level in this topic has skyrocketed. And we feel that in order to best get everybody on the same page and share what goes on in the design of running shoes is crucial. And so we have four experts who are going to be sharing their work and their theories and the concepts behind what they do. So what we're going to do today is first let them each have a chance to speak and share their philosophies and the science underlying the shoe development and how uh, these factors may influence performance and injury risk across uh, the spectrum. In order to make this successful, I want to make sure that we give credit to our presenters and we're going to go in alphabetical order here. Uh, Blaine Hedinga, Eric Rohr, Tony Post, and Stephen Sashin from Adidas, from Brooks, Topo Athletic, and Zero Shoes. We're very excited to have this very diverse panel uh, because of the different variety of, uh, of shoe, shoe design and shoe wear. The way that we're going to move forward is have them present first, have the question and answer session from all of you because that's what drives the discussion. I will respectfully ask that if you have a question, I know it's going to get hard to navigate through the crowd, but please, if you could speak into the microphone because this is being recorded for people who can't be here today. Um, and then lastly, after we have our discussion, we're going to have a meet and greet with the inventors and the designers and seeing some specific shoe products in the adjacent room. So we hope that you can stick with us and take the time to meet folks that came here today to join me. Thank you. So I'm going to bring to the podium first Blaine Henninga, Dr. Henninga, uh, to come and talk about the science of the running shoe um, from Adidas. Thanks so much for the invitation to come and talk today. Uh, so at Adidas, we have lots of internal expertise. We have labs and designers and engineers, but we also have external contractors and researchers, and the oldest, probably the longest standing one was Ben O'Neill uh, at the University of Calgary. And I believe that partnership exists longer than I've been alive. And so it's not surprising that I think a lot of our thoughts are similar to some of the things that are coming out of his lab. And the big area there is the preferred mode path. And the idea that how someone runs or how an individual runs is inherent to who they are. And we can change shoes and change footwear. But essentially, that, that might change things a little bit um, distal, but proximally, how someone moves is how they move. And so, rather than trying to find a shoe to force someone to run in a certain way, our philosophy is to work with how someone is already moving and finding a shoe that works with them. And so when we think about matching a shoe, uh, we, we come at it from three things. We want to decrease injuries, we want to increase performance, and it should feel good. And so in the context of injuries, um, every shoe, every new model that comes out, we go through a series of testing, of mechanical tests, of biomechanical tests, uh, that goes through a wear test and, and running. Um, but when we get deeper into it, bigger concepts, some of those things we take deeper dives and look at. Uh, in one example, we had a shoe out a couple years ago that across the board could minimize joint moments and loading. And it was really exciting and interesting, and I think at that point in time is where you find the tension between industry and academia, because the next step is to do a randomized controlled trial and prove that this would decrease injuries. And this is, I think, where things get a little bit difficult, because from a footwear company, we are very cautious to make statements or claims, and so even if we could do that and have that information, 
it, the business side of things kind of gets a little bit stuck. And when people go to write grants, the grant agencies say, well, the shoe company should pay for that. And those things kind of just never happen. Um, the other thing we look at is maximizing performance. And this is a little bit more fun, and it's a little bit easier to get at, uh, because we can quantify time and running economy. And we know we can change fourth abandonment difference. We know we can change uh, the foam and some of the compliance. And all of those things can increase performance. What gets interesting is on an individual level is for any one of those things, on an individual, they, they may have zero influence or they may have much more than the one or two percent that we see across the board. And the question becomes is what do I need to know about a specific person to match that person to that right product? And that's where some of our research is going in. Was this good? And so the third thing that we look at is this preference. And I think this is probably the most important one, or, or bigger than people realize. There's a little bit of evidence to suggest that if people are given the chance to choose a shoe or pick a preference, that you can decrease injuries and increase performance. Um, and this is a bigger one because we want to get to the experience. And as a company, when you run in a shoe, we want it to feel different. And these are things that become, I think, more important. Because if we think injury, um, in my experience, people are really passionate about injury prevention after they're already hurt. But it's really hard to kind of sell it up front. Uh, in the context of performance, if you're an elite athlete, performance absolutely matters. But if you went for the 5K run this morning, and I could give you a shoe that made you one, two, three percent more better running economy, the reality is most people are just running for exercise to get out. And so that also is maybe not the most important thing. And so the thing we go after the most is actually this preference. And I think the big thing here is it's not just comfort. To me, preference puts comfort in context of what you use it in. Um, are you going to use it for speed interval training? Are you going for a long recovery run? And that is a piece that becomes also very subject specific. So we get to the place then is how do we recommend a product? So if I want to look at performance, I have, there's things and algorithms I know, I can bring you into my lab, I can collect these things, and I can put you in a shoe with high confidence that will increase performance and do some kind of things with that. The problem with that is it's a high friction interaction. Or it might work for the people in this room, but it's not gonna work for the masses. So when we sell millions of shoes, it, it's not something, an interaction that I can have. And so to me, the interesting thing of where we're going to is what do I need to know about you that I can get for free or whether it's wearables or those kind of things I, I think is where some of the research is heading from an in industry perspective. So the last thing uh, I just want to talk about quickly is this is a new shoe that uh, came out this year for us. It's the FutureCat 40 and it's a 3D printed shoe. So the midsole is 3D printed and from a research perspective this is really cool because I have the opportunity to influence the material, the lattice, so what the design is of the structure, and as well as every single one of those struts, I can change the stiffness of. So I can now completely control what that midsole is. So most midsole foams are essentially homogeneous. So how they act in the vertical and the anterior posterior is about all the same. And with this, we can get to how it deforms and what directions things deform. And so the process we go through just quickly for interest sake is a combination between sports science, the designers, and the engineering team. So we take typical biomechanics of inputs into models with foot pressure and how they move, and we put that into uh, talking with our designers. And we have tools then, this is just an, an example of a tool where we can essentially slide stiffness up and down. This is vertical stiffness, it's just a visual representation. But we can essentially define or decide on how we want that structure to look. We send that to the engineers and we go through a, a simulations of the lattice structure, then we move over to just components, whether that's heels or forefoot, and then into the entire shoe. And so this is how we're beginning to, or will get to customization down the road. But from a research perspective, this is how we can answer questions that we haven't been able to answer before. And then we test it. But that's all I have from my side. Thank you so much for your attention.
a picture of the audience because this is fantastic. There, it's not just me that loves running shoes, everybody else here does too. Everybody say CSF. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So we're just very excited to see such a robust, excited crowd. This is, I gotta do this all the time because nobody comes to my talk. Well, I'm going down to Davis this morning. So next we want to have Dr. Uh, Eric Rohr from Brooks come up and show their products and discuss his their philosophy on making shoes. It's an honor to be here today to talk about a philosophy that Brooks has developed called Run Signature. Um, and it, it, Blaine did a great introduction. I think there's going to be some re repetitive uh, conversation here. but. It tells you that we're all thinking of the same things and then bringing unique aspects and solutions to life. So Run Signature for us is a holistic approach to designing and fitting running shoes. As we're building our shoes, we're looking at not a single parameter such as pronation, which is what the industry has been built on, but we're looking at starting with a knee and understanding through coupling how the foot and the knee work together to provide footwear solutions that keep the knee in its preferred motion path. And like Blaine said, our goals are to optimize efficiency, reduce the risk of injury, and enhance comfort. Uh, what I'm talking about today is many years of research that's been conducted in the Brooks Lab, along with collaborations. We have nine year partnerships with Dr. Joseph Hamill and Dr. Bruder, uh, Peter Brugerman. I'm happy to talk about all these publications and studies after the panel. Um, but with five minutes, I can't get into them. But everything that I'm talking about, we've done research on and have tried to publish things. Uh, before I talk about the biomechanics, which is why all of you guys are here, I want to talk a little bit about the preference thing that Blaine alluded to. And that's run signature really starts out with a biomechanical assessment of you as a runner. We want to know how you're moving, how your knee moves, most importantly, and whether it's in its preferred motion path. And then knowing and assessing how you move, we want to provide opportunities, choice, and, and, and differences to the runner. So runners want different experiences on the road and on the trail. And we've divided our footwear line into energized, cushion, speed, and connect. And in this, what we've provided is, is a shoe that optimizes the biomechanical needs and necessities of a runner. So today, when you get a biomechanical assessment through the process I'm going to explain, you're not handed one shoe that is the solution for you you're handed at least four shoes that can then give you the opportunity to have a performance underfoot that you're desiring. And in some cases, runners actually want multiple purposes. They might want a cushion shoe when they want to disconnect. They might want an energy shoe, energized shoe when they're training for racing or racing. Speed shoes are for racing. So this opens up the opportunity of like the, the runner has a choice. So now we'll talk about biomechanics. So run signature is based on the habitual motion path, and what it really entails is understanding the anatomy and physiology of, of ourselves. We know that everybody has unique bone shapes and geometries. We all have different muscle strengths and muscle imbalances that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, and each one of us has different ligament stiffnesses. This actually determines how your joint wants to move. So if we can appreciate who you are from a from an anatomical perspective, we can identify a personal baseline and use that personal baseline to recommend shoes that will align your knee into its habitual motion path. An example of the habitual motion path being true is that this is a study where we look at six cadavers. We uh, underwent 10 running strikes on each one of the subjects. And so the lines there are actually showing 10 foot strikes. What you see is those lines lined right up on top of each other. So it's a highly repeatable motion, but each one of us is individual. So what we want to do is provide footwear that's going to embrace your unique movement patterns, um, not correct patterns, but embrace them, and, and then uh, utilize the high repeatable motion of the knee. Another example of this idea is when you look at the 2012 US Olympic trials, these are elite athletes that are running at high performance levels and, and relatively the same time, yet you can see the vast differences of how they land on the ground. So what this leads to is that there's no right way to run. You can't pick up a book and understand like this is how we want to run and this is the shoe for you, but if we can assess your personalized baseline and understand how your body moves in running, 
we can use this to embrace you as an individual and, and describe the footwear for you. So how does this work? Well, basically we've done studies looking at single leg squat, double leg squat, walking, running, jumping. What we found is that if we take a minimal load stage, such as a two-legged squat, which is 50% body weight on each leg, we can look at the knee ab and adduction motion, and we can look at the tibial internal rotation of the knee. We can use this to identify how your body wants to move due to who you are at that given point in time, and we develop a personalized baseline. Then more importantly, we look at what's happening in running, and so under this ab body load, what is changing in that knee motion pattern? And the difference between the run and the squat is described as a deviation. What we see when looking at hundreds of runners is that there are many people that in running and in squatting maintain the same knee motion patterns. In this case, we're looking for footwear solutions that essentially get out of the way and allow the body to do what it wants to do because it's finding its habitual motion path by itself. However, there's a number of people where knee motions increase in this loaded, added loaded weight, you know, in running. And in that case, we're looking for shoes that provide guidance and support at the foot level using coupling to then put the knee into its habitual motion path. I mentioned a couple times today that run signature is based on coupling, and the idea is, is that we're looking at calcaneal adduction and calcaneal inversion. Um, both of these are tied very closely to what happens at the knee. There's direct correlations to how tibial and turner rotation happens, and it also affects knee ab and adduction. What's interesting is that the footwear industry for a long time has looked at posting, which addresses eversion, but calcaneal adduction is actually more closely correlated to tibial and turner rotation. And so by looking at more than one parameter and being more holistic, we're able to identify opportunities that are going to address body movements at the knee. And so to end this, I want to talk a little bit about a technology that, that has come out of this. So the philosophy not only is matching a shoe to a runner, but it's also how do we build shoes. And so introducing later this year, we're going to introduce the concept called Guide Rails. It's going to be in our Adrenaline, our Transcend, and our Ravenna. And uh, starting in November, you'll be able to see these shoes. I've got these shoes in, in a bag that you guys can see after the presentation. What we see on the left is that we have a medial and a lateral insert into the midsole of the, of the shoe. And it's a smart system. It works with your foot and using coupling to stabilize the knee. It's holistic. It's looking at multiple parameters to understand what the body's needs are. So it's addressing calcaneal adduction and eversion in, in the geometry and design of the components um, to help address tibial internal rotation of the knee. And it's an on-demand system. If you're someone that doesn't have a lot of eversion or adduction of the, of the foot, um, it basically stays out of the way. And then as you fatigue and those motions increase, or if you're somebody that needs help right from their first step out of the gate, this uh, technology will engage. And I didn't put a slide in here, but the last thing I'll mention is that personalization is a big deal here. And, and so what we are doing is we're evolving our technologies. We're working with HP, um, RS Scan and Desma to develop personalized footwear using these concepts I described today to modify the midsole materials due to your biomechanical needs. And uh, coming out next year, we'll actually start having some personalized solutions as a brand. So with that, I would love to show you guys some of these components after the panel presentation. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Tommy Post, and he is the CEO of Topo Athletic. Good morning, everybody, and thanks to ACSM for inviting us here. So, if you didn't figure out, Topo Athletic is kind of a uh, combination of my name there. We're pretty simple about that. Um, this is a slide that basically shows how old I am. <laughs> um, that's a photo from me in 1983. I used to be a competitive runner, ran competitively at the uh, University of Tulsa, and then for a few years after that, went to work for the Rockport Company. A lot of you probably know Rockport was the first um, casual and dress shoe company to use 
athletic shoe technology on the shoes. And to demonstrate that point, I actually ran a couple of marathons in Rockport for Esports. Um, I went from Rockport to Vibram. I was president of Vibram for 11 years. And during that period, we introduced a product that nobody believed uh, when, we, when we launched it. It actually took a few years before it started to take off. And that, of course, is the Vibram Five Fingers. I'm sure there's all kinds of controversy we can address <laughs> after that. <laughs> but I learned a lot of things at, at, at both of those companies that kind of helped shape what I wanted to create with Toco Athletic. And so with Toco, um, you know, we've, we've evolved. And, and along the way, we've gathered a bunch of research. So during the kind of the period when we were working on Vibram Five Fingers, I uh, knew a professor at Harvard, uh, Dan Lieberman, probably some of you have seen Dan speak or may know him personally. And I learned a lot from him about how humans evolved over a period of time and how evolution played a role in how we became natural runners. Also around that time, and I know some of you have also know uh, Dr. Brueggemann, I, I read his research and a really simple one-page paper that basically showed that using minimal footwear could help strengthen muscles in the feet and lower legs. And this was at a time when so many people were producing shoes that had a lot of plastic parts and a lot of structure and stability features and trying to work to control motion. And this really resonated with me because as a runner at University of Tulsa back in the late 70s and early 80s, our coach used to have us do strides across the football field barefoot at the end of a speed workout. And he was trying to teach us to strengthen the muscles in our feet and lower legs. So, when we created Topo, what we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of bridge the gap a little bit between some of the things that the body does naturally, but realizing that abrupt transitions from, let's say, running barefoot or running in a minimal shoe or five fingers, you may need something that kind of helps bridge that gap in between. So with Topo, we have a really simple philosophy. Our our philosophy, and it's a little hard to tell with this slide, it kind of got blown up, I guess, there. But it, it has three features to it. And all three features are really designed to encourage natural movement. So the first thing is we want to create a roomy toe box that allows your toes to really spread naturally. We're not the first company to do that, but what we found is that a lot of shoes that fit like that don't necessarily provide security through the midfoot and the waist that allow you to feel nimble and agile when you move. I'm also a big believer in shoes that do have a low drop or a zero drop, but I also recognize not everybody can run in a zero drop shoe. If they're coming from a 10 millimeter shoe, 10 millimeter drop shoe, that abrupt transition can cause all kinds of problems. So we wanted to create low drop shoes that would allow you to make that transition more successfully. And lastly, you know, personally, I don't really like to wear shoes that much anyway. So when we created shoes, we wanted to make sure that they were ultra lightweight. So starting with the roomy toe box, we really believe that that's key, but it only works if the foot is secure in the shoe. So we created a shoe that has a more contoured or shaped waist that allows you to secure the midfoot and make that heel fit securely as well. Low drop is important, I think, because it encourages more of a midfoot strike, which we believe is a healthy way to run. But again, like you heard from some of the other panelists, you know, people run in different ways. So we wanted to create shoes with different levels of drop. We allow you to pick the shoe, both the drop and the stack height that works for you. A little bit like I was saying before, allowing that personalization. I really like a shoe like the ST2 on the left, which is a 16 millimeter zero drop platform, but I also recognize, especially coming through the whole experience of Vibram, that there are some people that may need a little more cushioning or a little more heel to toe drop as they transition. Lightweight has always been important, and so we were one of the first companies to start to, and this was really <laughs> out of necessity. The way people were making shoes back in the early 2000s, typically what you would do is cut and stitch pieces together to make a pattern. 
when we were doing view from five fingers, we couldn't afford some of the minimums on the microfibers, and we didn't really want to add all those layers. So we were one of the first companies that actually started printing the uppers directly onto the mesh, on the flat pattern meshes. And like a lot of other companies, we really only want to put rubber where you need it for both slipper resistance and abrasion. To my knowledge, there really aren't any studies that show a correlation between a specific shoe or brand that can reduce injuries. Now, certainly you can wear shoes that may help cause a problem or, you know, create issues for you, but I don't think that there are really a lot of, there's a shoe out there that can necessarily fix or correct a problem. I think one of the things I learned, again, going back to that 30 or 40 years ago, is that healthy running really begins with taking care of your body. By addressing stability and mobility issues in the body, you're able to create and start movement patterns that can serve as the building blocks for good running form. And that's why on our website, we dedicate a whole section of that site to things where you can kind of do self-assessment, offer strength and conditioning exercises that can increase mobility. So at Topo, we really believe that the best shoe is a shoe that enables unhindered form, allows for you to progress as a natural runner, and, and enjoy a long, healthy running career. I'll be around afterward as well, so happy to talk about this more. Thanks. So our final presenter in this sequence is going to be Steve Jackson. He is the CEO of Zero Shoes. I, no, I got it. And I'm going to go over here. So I stood behind there. You would just see a head. <laughs> so there are a lot of different footwear brands out there. And there's really no reason to start another. Unless your shoes can change people's lives. And that's our goal of Zero Shoes. So what changes people's lives? Addictive comfort. By addictive, we mean the kind of thing that once you experience it, you don't want to and can't go back to anything else. Lifelong health. I don't care if you're a marathoner and you win the Olympics at 35 and you can't continue running after you're 40. And of course, improved performance. Now, I'm going to warn you in advance, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be that kind of thing where you just go, duh. It's all really common sense. What we're doing is really pretty simple. So let's talk about comfort. What makes something comfortable? Here we go. Uh, if you haven't already, because I see some of you have, if you're in the mood, kick off your shoes. Or just imagine, stand up a long day, you come home, maybe you've been on your feet all day, or a long run, or a workout, and imagine taking off your shoes. And the question is, do you feel better? If you do, you've been wearing the wrong shoes. If you haven't gone to bed, accidentally still wearing your shoes because you forgot you had them on, not because you were going to pass out, <laughs> then you're wearing the wrong shoes. It's really pretty straightforward. Now, what I'm going to tell you came from my experience. Um, I got out of motion control shoes and into what is the technology behind Zero Shoes. It turned me from a habitually injured runner to a runner with no injuries, where my habitually like family joke flat feet developed arches. I became a master's all-American sprinter. In fact, for men over the age of 55, uh, you might be looking at the fastest Jew in the world. So what's the technology we came up with? It really predates technology. It predates science. It predates footwear. It's feet. Your feet are a miracle. We just let your feet be feet. Your feet, their job is to bend and move and flex and feel the world. If you don't let them do that job, that function tries unsuccessfully to move upstream into your ankle, your hip, your knee, your back. And so we try and let your feet do their job. You might know this actually, a quarter of the bones and joints of your entire body are in your feet and ankles. One, uh, more nerve endings in your soles than any of your fingertips and your lips. You're supposed to use these things. Your feet are your foundation. It's really pretty simple. If you don't use them, you can lose them. The good news is if you've lost them, you can get it back. So let's chat about that. Similar to what Tony was saying, we have a foot first design. We know you want your toes to spread and relax and move naturally. By the way, you can't engage your arch properly if your big toe can't move properly, which you can't do if they're squeezed like that. 
We're low to the ground for balance and agility, zero drop, super, super flexible, no unnecessary arch support or toe spring. What you can't see in there is how lightweight these are. What you can't see is how that patented field true sole gives you the right combination of protection, but also the ground feel that you need so your brain knows what's happening at the other end of your body so it knows how to control everything in between. True lifelong comfort comes from letting your feet do what's natural and therefore letting the rest of your body do the same. The ligaments, tendons, muscles that you have in your lower body are better springs and shock absorbers than any foam or cushioning that's ever been invented. More resilient too, you don't need to replace them every couple hundred miles. So that design carries through all of our products. We do performance and casual shoes and sandals that people use for everything from taking a walk to running, hiking, running ultra marathons. That crazy little pair of sandals at the very far right there. Uh, we had a couple who ran a 256K stage race across Madagascar with a pair of those. Not a problem. So let's talk about, about the health part. As Tony said, there's really no, no evidence that some specific shoe uh, improves foot health. Um, but let's actually, let's talk, do it from a performance standpoint. It improves performance. Now, I'm not a big fan of anecdotal data. I would say that it's evidence. I would say that it's data. Let's say anecdotal evidence, not necessarily data. But we have over 7,000 people who say that when they started wearing your product, it's allowed them to run, walk, hike, do yoga, crossfit, etc., pain-free for the first time in years or maybe the first time ever. You can't ignore that information. Now, I <laughs> a related note, though. I kind of highlight this. The burden of proof about whether these are good for you is not on us, really. If you think about it, for the 10,000 years that human beings have been making footwear, the first 9,952 of those, all the footwear looked like that. We're not the intervention. Let's talk about the health side. There's actually a lot of very interesting research that's been done and being done that basically shows this simple idea, if you let your feet do their job, there are benefits. You increase intrinsic foot muscle strength. You can affect plantar fasciitis, knee osteoarthritis, balance, alignment, everything in between. And that's really our job is to let your feet do their job. Let your feet be feet. In the same way that you think of natural food as the obvious better choice, our goal is to make natural movement the obvious better choice so that you can experience the fun and benefits of that life change and comfort and live life feet first. Thank you. So now that we've had a discussion from each one of our panelists, we're going to open up the floor to questions from the audience. We have a question for our, our various panelists here. I want to thank them for the great presentations. It's very insightful to hear what the thoughts are and the philosophy, so I enjoyed that quite a bit. It's always nice to have that experience. So if we have any questions, please come up to the microphone here in the center and we'll answer some questions. <coughs> Could any of the panelists comment on uh sustainability, recycling, uh, biodegradability, anything not true. Um, I'd say that, you know, sustainability is obviously something that, that, that the Brooks brand we find important. The uh, U.S. is actually looking at different ways where we're going to have to be reporting what our sustainability efforts are. And um, it's something that we do every day. We have shoes like the Green Silence, where it was 100% recyclable and had different materials. It's something that we try to look at. How do we minimize waste? How do we have biodegradable materials in our midsoles? Um, so it's something that's front and center in mind, but I think you know, at the same time, performance, comfort, and all those other things are aspects that we look at. We love it, yes. Okay. We're having trouble to that point, so. Technical difficulty. Yeah, um, I would agree. It's an absolutely important part of our company, and it's not something that I'm personally responsible for. Um, but the well, we have a bunch of things that are on the market. Uh, we have some uh, partnerships with Parlay, so we take recycled ocean plastic to create shoes. Um, and I, I would encourage you to look at some of the different companies and some of their ratings as to how sustainable they are and their environmental impact. I think one thing that people don't really realize is uh, when you go to make shoes, you can have, say, 60 different suppliers of parts of those shoes, depending on the color and the materials and stuff. And so to, to do your due diligence, you can only, not only, you, you go so far until it becomes 
really difficult to kind of, if you want to certify a vegan chew or something, it's not as simple as it sounds when you start really going down the, the road that way. Other questions? I actually want to answer that. Oh, I'm sorry. So with zero, as everyone's basically been saying, making footwear totally sustainable is very difficult. One of the ways that we address this is because our footwear is so minimalist, we're using fewer materials, so there's less energy, there's less, less material going into it, and much more durability. Our patented Feel True Soul has a 5,000 mile warranty. So the lifetime value of that, the lifetime cost of that is much lower than anything where a midsole wears down and you have to replace it after a couple hundred miles. So as we're waiting for other people to come up and think of a question, I wanted to ask, uh, a lot of the discussions seem to revolve around the individualization of the shoe, sort of let the foot do its job or let the person get into a visual motion. Do the panelists see a future where the person will have a 3D printed shoe that matches that philosophical, so that you can measure the person and then the shoe prints specifically for that person instead of a mass produced shoe? to the 3D guys. Don't say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's it? Uh, yeah, I, it's not a simple answer in that absolutely I think we're moving towards that direction. Um, the reality is when you look at the volume of shoes that are sold, uh, that, that transition is not as simple as it sounds. I know we have a, a speed factory in Atlanta where we're making shoes locally. That is ways that we can begin to get to customization um, or realize some customizations. Um, but certainly that, that 3D printing does other things too. It allows us to make shoes without molds, um, which means we can go faster and we can do exactly that and of one type product. Okay. Uh, so real quick, I believe that there isn't a right shoe um, or a golden shoe that's gonna solve problems. I think we're moving into the world where there's going to be a shoe for you and personalization and, and utilizing the biomechanical data both on the run through wearables and also through lab work is going to provide a plethora of opportunities and, and we're going to try to personalize that footwear to be specific to your needs. I think the question is a little off in that even if we could make something customized and personalized for an individual, the magic question is, does that produce injury? Does that improve performance? If everything's built on the same fundamental idea, high so uh, uh, higher heel, thicker sole, more cushioning, flared sole, stiff outsole, then it, it, it probably won't matter if it's made just for you. There are other factors that probably lead to the things that we like and want, which would be comfort, performance, and injury prevention. I'm wondering if you could all comment on how orthotics fit into your lines. <laughs> so the question was how do orthotics fit into our, our products and our lines? Um, the majority of our testing that we do doesn't um, involve around orthotics. However, we know that there are a lot of needs and necessities of runners that, that maybe want or need this, or doctors are told that they, they need to run in it. Um, our footwear is designed to allow orthotics to be put in place, and what we would do is, I, I mentioned that we look at the squat and the run and, and understand what the deviation is there. We would recommend that when they go through the assessment that they actually take their orthotic and use that, and then also remove their orthotic so that they're understanding, do they need that orthotic, and if they do, what is the right shoe that works with that solution? I would add that, you know, we recognize, even though we're a company that makes it footwear that is designed to allow the foot to move and work more naturally, that there are times when people need to make that transition. So there may be a time where somebody is, is used to wearing an orthotic or needs to wear an orthotic for a particular reason, but over a period of time, you really want to do things that allow the body to become stronger and more mobile. So don't expect that, otherwise you're just treating the symptom. The real goal is ultimately to try to get your body to work better and to, and to remove that necessity from your life if you can. It's not always possible, but if you can. Obviously, I totally agree with Tony in that regard. And I'm, I'm going to reframe the question, is, which is, when would it make sense to put your foot in the cast and keep it there? There was an outsole, or sorry, a orthotic manufacturer that had an ad, they were at a trade show next to us, that said, basically, we had a drawing of a bare foot and then a drawing of a bare foot with their insole. 
and it said up to a release up to 34% less, uh, wait, 34% less stress instantly. And I said, by less stress, were you measuring muscle activation? They said, yeah. I said, so what you're saying is as soon as I step on that thing, I get 34% weaker instantly. How much weaker is better for me? I mean, shouldn't I just put my foot in the cast and have 100% less stress? So I agree with Tony. People will wear whatever they want in our shoes. They're designed so you can. But an orthotic is a, is a device for treating you, not for something you're gonna do for the rest of your life. Thank you, next question. I have a comment regarding the shoe for me. Um, I've, I run marathons, Ironmans. Um, I run anywhere from negative 10 to 100 miles per week on and off. I have never bought the same shoe twice, ever. I you know I've had expensive shoes I, where I go straight to the sales rack. I try on whatever, and whatever feels good, I end up buying. Go around, I, and I never wear the same shoe for two consecutive runs. I have about six to eight pairs of running shoes. What's going on? Is that just me? <laughs> First of all, I love that philosophy. And, and not just because from a commercial point of view. I mean, I think uh, at Topo, we really embrace the idea of, of trying to change your footwear all the time. You know, we realize that not everybody can afford necessarily to own four or five or six pair of shoes, but you should. Um, the truth is, you know, footwear works differently depending on the workout, and you want to do things that are always activating different muscles and different parts of your body. We do that when we do all other types of workouts, so why wouldn't you do it when you run? I think that makes a lot of sense what you're doing. Yeah, I would agree. There's some peer re research that would suggest that using multiple shoes is good for you and injury preventative, and you should do that. Um, I think conceptually, too, though, I think the reality is, is you can probably run, anyone can probably run in any shoe they want. It's just kind of what threshold until they're, that's not quite maybe working with them or their body hasn't adapted to that and it would take some time. Um, that, you know, this right shoe for you idea, it, it, you can run barefoot, you can run in a big clunky shoe, and you can probably run three miles and not get injured. And so it's more about where, where that threshold becomes to get. But yeah, change it up, change your runs up. Don't turn the same way every time. Don't do 5K every morning at 6 a.m. because then that's overused. I'll, I'll be real quick. So I think you know part of this is that we build shoes that are providing different uh, experiences. So I mentioned that we're looking at cushion, energize, speed, and, and connect. And the problem sometimes that happens is that when you go in to get fitted, um, the industry has really been based on the spectrum of support. And they determine what level of support you need, and then they say that these are the only shoes that work for you. And what we're trying to do as a brand is to actually have more universal support systems so that we can give the runners the freedom to have different uh, shoes on feet. We know that people want to run on different days for different reasons. And so we're actually aligned to what you just said, and that's there's a different shoe for you every day. And, and if we can understand your needs, we're trying to solve that problem. I would just add, it's not the shoe. It's not about the shoe. It's about the you. And so you are, as Eric was saying, different on different days. Uh, if your research that I saw in Bill Sands' lab, he's the former head of biomechanics for the U.S. Olympic Committee. Every different shoe affects your gait in some way. So what might be happening is just one day, one shoe feels better just based on what's happening with your musculature. If you're in something that gets out of the way and lets your feet do their job, the thing that's gonna make the difference is the surfaces you're on, whether you're running fast or slow or on a trail on the road, more than it is gonna be about the footwear. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question. Hi, I have a question for Mr. Steven Session. Um, I remember you mentioned earlier that you had flat feet. Um, and by using these zero shoes, you managed to uh, somewhat regain uh, an arch. Could you possibly elaborate more so on that? Here's the shortest answer I can give. My feet got stronger because I was using them. Okay. Um, and also, usually the same approach when you go to a store, it's like, oh yeah, you want to see that if you can bend it, there's not really much support. So. Where do you draw that line of how much support you need or? Right about there. <laughs> okay. Seriously, we have tens of thousands of people who've run millions of miles in this, but that's not just us. This is basically, if you look at the oldest footwear ever designed, it looks like this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next question. Curious, 
year changes um, when you guys approach trail shoes, if there's any change at all from each of your processes? I'll, I'll start on that one because actually I'm going to refer not only to my Topo experience but to my Vibram experience because we worked with a lot of different companies. Obviously, you know, Vibram makes soles for a lot of different outdoor shoes and brands. Um, and so, you know, I think that, again, depending on what the company wants to do and, and, and what the end goal is, one of the primary purposes and functions of that sole is not necessarily to um, correct or fix movement, but to provide you with safety or security on whatever surface you're running on. So you want things that allow for mud and snow release, you want rubber that is going to um, you know, make good contact surfaces. Um, I think those things are probably in a trail shoe as more as important or more important than any of the other features that you would that you would put inside. I maybe an, an obvious answer to that, but you know trail shoes are, are pretty broad. You can take basically a running shoe and move it up, or you can take a hiking boot and kind of move it down. But certainly the use case of the traction, I think the other big thing, in my opinion, on trail shoes that become important is when you start to get into the upper. Um, and if you are running downhill and you're, and you're sliding and jamming your toes at the front of the toe box, that, that's not a good experience. And so, um, you know, in my opinion, when I look at a, a trail shoe, I consider more for an upper, must have a little bit less compliant. And when I think about, um, in general, I think what you like, I don't like the word control, but I think there's something about confidence. When you're in a shoe, you want it to be predictable and you want to know what you're expecting. And that's even more so than in a trail when you're in a kind of a, a different environment, you want to be able to still have confidence in your shoe that it's with you and you're not going to be limited by it. I agree with both of those points, and to that end, I, mean, I just have to bring up, this is a trail shoe that we developed, and to Tony's point, we took our best-selling running shoe and added just this really great, grippy, leggy sole. We also added sort of, we hid just a tiny, tiny bit of something we call trail foam in the, in the inside of the sole, just to give a little bit of extra cushion, and the lacing system that we have is designed so that it can cinch up around your midfoot and give you that security that you're looking for. So it sounds like there could be a few additive features depending on the challenge of the event. I would, I would say just the one last thing about that is that I also think that the plating aspect is important just from a safety point of view again that you want to have some level of protection depending on the surfaces you're running on but a lot of the ultra trail runs today are over really difficult challenging rugged surfaces and just having a little bit of extra foot protection not necessarily cushioning you can still keep the platform low so you have great ground contact but having that plating or just a little bit of plating can help protect the foot without taking away any of that intuitive kind of feeling. And again, it's a personal thing. I mean, I've run with people on those kind of trails who were barefoot, but they spent a lot of time learning how to pay attention to how they're running. They can do that. But most people aren't going to do that. I totally agree with Tom. Next question. Um, so you talked a lot about the more minimalist shoes, uh, addressing muscular issues and improving pathological mechanics uh, through improving the musculature. Um, for runners that are having issues with mechanics due to ligamentous injury, say you know, someone who sprains their ankle a lot and they have a lot of ligamentous laxity, uh, do you feel that the mental issues can be appropriate for those individuals since their issues are not musculature but more permanent in nature? So if you have some real ligament laxity, you need to treat that. I mean, that's something that I had. Prolotherapy was a huge help for that. But basically, once you've treated the injury, you want to give your body the opportunity to work with that. Ligament laxity is something where, yeah, strengthening is not going to strengthen your ligaments. So you'll have to deal with that uh, specifically. But then you've got all the musculature around that that's going to keep that in place. So that's what you want to work with. And having something that lets your foot work the way a foot works lets you do that. Next question. Hi. So if you bring someone into the lab and say you do determine their habitual movement path, how do you go from that towards designing a shoe that is going to be optimal for them? There you go. So I, I think I have two answers to that. One is that in the lab, we're looking at those parameters. We have hundreds of people that run, and, and we do four, six, seven rounds of testing of a shoe before it goes to market. 
So we're addressing, uh, we look at functional groups. So we're addressing different types of writing styles and different motions to identify what we need for those individuals. I think the other question is, is how do you actually determine what your habitual motion path is in the field? And um, so one of the things that we've done as a brand is we've made a, an app that measures the knee motions and the foot motions. Um, it's available at all Brooks running events. If you go to an expo of a, uh, a marathon that Brooks is at, we have a, a, a app there. We're also working with FitStation right now to get the habitual motion path uh, functions into that Fit system. So the reality is that people don't people do look at the knees when they fit, but they might not be seeing the intricacies that they need to. And so we're working with a lot of companies to try and bring those details to life. Uh, I have a question. What kind of variables are you looking at with that app? We're looking at knee ab and adduction, tibial turner rotation calcaneal adduction, and calcaneal inversion. So how do you get kinematics out of an app? So the app that we've developed uses a, a 2D imaging camera from the iPad. Um, and we have reflective markers on the actual leg above and below the knee, and then also at the heel of the foot. And we're using similar principles that you would use in, in motion analysis to identify the angles. Does that reduce ecological validity? So what I'm talking about right now is trying to bridge what we can do in the, in the in our lab to what you guys are going to encounter when you go to a running store. I think that in the future, wearable technology is going to advance and allow us to do our footwear validation in the field. It's also going to allow for people to run into a running store and show data that will allow them to get into the shoes. But right now, the wearable technology and the sharing of the data isn't in a system where, where you know, a running store can utilize that. That time is coming, and I think that's you know, definitely where at least our brand is focused on trying to figure out how to fit and, and select the right shoes for you. Dr. Davis. I also want to thank you all for coming. I think it's, it's, it's this is amazing. I don't think I've seen a room this full in a long time. So there's a lot of interest, obviously. So I'm struck when I look at the panel about um, how this panel would be maybe 50 years ago, right? And what people would be thinking. It'd be so different. Um, and I, you know, 50 years ago we were running in shoes that had nothing in them, no support, no cushioning, um, and injuries. There were no reports of injuries at that time. And so I'm just wondering what your all, all of your thoughts are into the development of the thought that this beautiful structure needs to be supported and cushioned. Because that has only happened in the last 50 years. So I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Thanks. Who wants to start with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll add one thing. So it, it, this is not going to answer that question, Irene, but it's uh, I was saying to a couple people, I was at the uh, ACSM conference in 1986 when I was working for Rockport, and we were trying to convince people, convince people that walking briskly could actually improve cardiovascular health. And so it's really, I mean, I think that's something that everybody takes for granted. At that time, people said if you weren't running or doing aerobics or, you know, really stressing the heart rate in some way, you probably weren't going to be able to make any kind of serious advancement in an in, in individual's cardiovascular health. So I think it's cool to see how, you know, how quickly ideas evolve and how much the world can change. And I'm a big believer in that. I think there's a reason for all of these brands to exist and to thrive. But I also know that over time, people's ideas and opinions about the things that they need in their life will change. And so we're kind of banking on that. Uh, oh, sorry. Following up on that, as, as you said, I mean, it's been 50 years, a little over two generations. And once the two generations have passed, things suddenly become common knowledge. So stuff that was radically new back in the early 70s, now, well, that's just the way you do. Feet need support. You need cushioning. You need padding. You need to protect your foot instead of use your foot. But back in the 60s, this was not an idea. If you look at Arthur Lydiard, who's one of the greatest running coaches of all time, one of the most successful coaches, he's from New Zealand, he had more world champions in this tiny little country than almost anywhere else. And you look at the shoes that he put on his athletes, they looked like ours. They were basically just a little bit to protect you from the ground and something to hold it on your feet. So 
I mean, I'm not going to mince words. The more you look into how feet work, the more you look into the research, including research done by Irene, about what happens when you let feet do their job, the more difficult it is to come to any conclusion other than the modern running shoe is just not a great idea. It just hasn't improved performance and reduced injury the way people say that it has. And it's just become common wisdom that that's the way you're supposed to do it. We're just not seeing that. We're seeing the exact opposite. When people get out of their shoes and into something that lets their feet work naturally, that's when they have these radical changes. That's what I'm seeing as we're hearing from our customers. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, you know, I, I don't know if this necessarily totally answers it, but I would agree with you to, to some extent. I think there's the, the pendulum of from one to the other. Um, and the reality is from an industry perspective, it's not as simple because, and what I mean by that is, so a couple of years ago I asked one of the business people, and I, I believe, and I don't agree with it, and I don't think it's a good thing, but I believe it's still about 40% of running shoes that are sold are still in some sort of a stability type thing in it. So if you also go in the context of if changing footwear without kind of adapting causes injury, you, to just simply just not provide those shoes to people, you, you, there's got to be a balance a little bit somewhere. And, and I would agree with you. I, I think people need to use their body and it's supposed to be used. Um, but it's not as simple to just simply make statements and to trickle even within the company and then to move to how shoes are sold or when you go to a store and it's on a wall. And I think what's missing, in my opinion, before you, you get big wide acceptance of kind of the shift in paradigm is that you need to replace it with something. So, so simply walk into a store and say, support, motion control, cushioning is all bad. That, that's fine, but they're still gonna make shoes and they're still gonna sell shoes. Um, and, and we need a better narrative to replace it. And I, I would argue that that new narrative is not it hasn't become sticky enough yet, or what it, there's nothing there to replace it. So I, you know, I, I don't disagree with you completely. I, I think there's still value in some protection. I don't focus as much on injury. I think there's something about the experience in issue and beginning to link up the biomechanics and the experience and the preference. I think is a, is a right space to explore, <coughs> um, but it's not a simple answer just to stop making the shoes. I think also it's not black and white. So if we go back into the 70s and you read Peter Kavanaugh's shoe book, what you see back then is that metatarsal stress fractures actually were the most common injury occurring. And what you see over the last 50 years is you've seen injuries shift and change to different locations because of the shoes that we've been building. You also go back to the 70s and you realize that most people that are running were pretty dedicated runners. The average person um, didn't really get into running because if you weren't someone who was vast and, and, and that type of per person, it wasn't ex it wasn't approachable. And so today, you know, we have people that um, are taking 20 years in their midlife to raise their families and then get back into running. They're out of shape. They have a lot of work to do. And what we're trying to do with footwear is is not to allow the foot not to work the way it wants to or to not strengthen the muscles, but in the time that it takes for them to strengthen their muscles, what can we put on their feet that allows them to move? And we have testimonial from a lot of our footwear that they were sedentary until they found one of our shoes and now they have an active lifestyle. So I think, again, it's, it's just not black and white and there's a solution for everybody and we're trying to find a spectrum for all of it. So I'm gonna make a, a quick comment and then we'll continue is it seems a lot like in this area there's been a big pendulum and you see that in everything in different areas of medicine and certainly with running and running shoes and athletics is the pendulum swung at one point from very minimal to uh, a lot of locking down the foot and i think what the panels have all described is a a change in some of the theory the theory of letting more natural motion occur and using different formats to help the people get to that point so i think it's a neat sort of an evolution that went all the way to one direction it's going to swing back, and like most things, it's going to bottle back and forth a little bit, but there is an evolution of thought that seems to be occurring. With that being said, we are literally out of time here. So we're going to hold the questions because we're going to move to the room next door. So I'm going to make my rule of that. I have to read this or else I'm going to get in trouble. So at this time, we'd like to thank the chairs and co-chairs of the ACSM Biomechanics Interest Group, 
who were instrumental in helping us identify some of today's panelists. If you have interest in biomechanics, we encourage you to check out the Biomechanics Institute Group on the ACSM website. And finally, if you'd like to continue the shoe conversation, we're going to have the meet and greet with our panel starting uh, at 1 o'clock right next door in room 102C. And I would like to thank our panelists and all of you for your coming to this session and interaction. Thank you.